Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Devin Yuji, original Grognard, sitting down. And what do we got here? We are stepping into Second World War at Sea, Coral Sea from Avalanche Press. We are doing the upper, well, one of the operational games <coughs> that was released with this kind of mini starter kit box set. Let's take a look at the cover real quick. There we go. First carrier battle, 1942. Picture, I think that's the Yorktown right there. So we've kind of been building up to this. We've seen some from my previous videos. I've showed you how the tactical system works on the tactical board there, and I've gone over how operations work. Now we're going to bring it all together and see how this actually plays out on the tabletop. Now, what I want to do first is I'm going to go over, and I don't normally do, I kind of do this with some of my videos, but basically I want to sit down and go over what the plan for the different task force are, what my overall plan with both sides are. <clears throat> I mean, even though I am going to be kind of using uh, the solitaire system that... Uh, uh, the solitaire table that uh, Avalanche Press uh, provides, you still need to identify what targets the, enemy, the, the your opponent, quote unquote, the AI uh, task force are going to be going for. I'm going to also try to do it as kind of maintaining some historical semblance as well. Um, and to kind of understand what the choices I'm going to be, be making, you got to understand how the battle for the Coral Sea evolved and and how it how it came together and came to be problem is i could probably spend a good couple of hours just going over that so i'm not gonna try to get too lost in that minutia if you really want to know about the battle of coral sea yeah you can kind of read the wiki but there's a lot better documentaries on youtube plenty of them out there uh that do a really good job of explaining how the battle formed up what mistakes were made how things happened but, like I said, to, to give you the reasons why I'm assigning some of the task forces, the jobs, and, and the overall quote-unquote programming at the beginning of the game, I kind of have to describe why I'm doing that. Uh, especially for the people who have no idea about the Battle of Coral Sea. <clears throat> All right, so what we're looking at right now, what are we looking at? We're looking at U.S. Japanese task force on the field. Obviously, yellow for the Japanese forces. And blue for the American task forces. We've got our airfields and all the aircraft on put on their holding boxes over there. A lot of the, the rules are not that complicated, but there's a lot of moving bits to it, really. So we're going to be kind of it's probably going to go a little bit slow the first few turns because one, it is a game I've never I've never done the operational side of this before, um, so I'm going to get things wrong again. This video is not a video of this is how the game should be played. This is a video of hey, this is this idiot Devin. This is how he plays the game, and hopefully it gives you some information for you to make your own decision if it's something you want to pursue. That's kind of what, what most of my videos are. I am no I am not great at any one game. I never will be. The simple fact is I don't want to devote that much time into one game to becoming good or great at it. Well, I want to be good at games, but I don't want to be great at anything because I like to play a lot. And I learned a long time ago, uh, I'm not going to be great at <laughs> very many games because I do like to bounce all over the place. And that's okay. That's how I do things. I'm, I'm happy with my gaming style. So, anyways, all right. So, let's take a look at what we have. For, first of all, we got... Uh, Task forces that are that are face down and task forces that are face up. The face down task forces, like that task force right there, that task force right there, and the U.S. have got two. Those are submarine task force. <coughs> Technically, with again, I will I will say this again. This is not a double blind system, so I'm I'm having to tweak the system somewhat so it will work for me in solo play. Normally, submarine groups are held off board. Well, obviously, I'm playing against myself. 
I can't really do that. And there's no real AI system for running the, the, the summary task forces. So they're out there. I know they're out there. I'm going to have to play like I don't know they're out there. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to step away from the meta. But, you know, I'm a mature enough. I'm an adult. I can do that. Anyways, um, so we got a couple, couple Japanese and U.S. submarine forces out there. Uh, let's take a look at the Japanese task force and let's go over what we're going to do with it. Look, first of all, let's take a look at this task force four right here, which is kind of, kind of forward deployed. I mean, it's, it's a couple hundred, 300. Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So 450 miles away from the closest U.S. task force. And I actually had some problems digging up information on this task force. Obviously, because I don't think it really did that much. It didn't contribute anything to the battle. But the entire task force uh, consists of... Uh, let's go ahead. Well, let's go, let's go ahead and take a look at them. Let's pull it off. The, and I do have my, my task forces over here. So the task force have their individual counters in them. So I know what's in each task force as I move them around. But this task force four, kind of an odd task force. It consists of the Kamikawa Maru and two light cruisers. Well, a sharp-eyed individual will look at the Kamikawa Maru and see it's a CV. It means it's a carrier. It is a carrier, sort of. It's a seaplane tender. Carried like, you know, 16 seaplanes on it. That was it. No fighters, nothing like that. There were four ships of the class that were made. Uh, she was torpedoed in 43 and then eventually sunk in 44. But so she's kind of out there. And the rules, the, 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 uh, box set specific rules say that you can do anti-submarine warfare sweeps with surface ships as long as they consist of cv clc you know there's a certain certain ships i don't think bbs and bcs can do any submarine warfare so from what i can tell it's pretty much an anti-submarine task force so and since it does consist of just a lightly armored transport ship that's been converted to be a seaplane tender and two light cruisers she's not going to want to muck around engaging with the American fleets. She's going to be out there. She's going to be hunting subs. Now, currently, the Japanese player, I make air quotes because the AI, doesn't know where the U.S. anti-submarine groups are at. That's fine. So what I'm going to do is they have a, a an assignment at the beginning. I'm going to indicate that they are going to be escorting the, uh, the Tulagi invasion force because basically the Japanese grabbed Tulagi because they wanted to turn it into a seaplane base so they could use it for reconnaissance. So I figure... The seaplane tender will want to hook up with the Tulagi invasion force as they're heading to Tulagi to invade. Okay, so that right there. Anything when I when it comes to to rolling for them, their direction, their destination is going to be wherever the Tulagi invasion force is. So that's easy enough to figure out. <coughs> Submarine task forces. Eh. They're not really going to be doing much of anything until somebody's been spotted. Then they'll start moving, so don't want to worry too much about the Japanese. And they can only move like one turn, one zone per turn anyways. All right, so that's Task Force 4. Let's take a look at what else we have. Task Force 3. Task Force 3 is kind of, kind of a big one. Task Force 3 is a Port Moresby invasion force. And it consists of uh, two cruisers and a handful of destroyers and eight troop transports. Now, historically... The Port Moresby invasion force didn't even leave Rabul until the 4th of May. So basically the fourth day of the fight. So we're going to maintain that same operational plan, the, the, the main Japanese plan MO. Um, so I, I will not be moving these guys out until the 4th of May, the, the first dawn turn of the 4th of May. And their destination is going to be Port Moresby. So they're just going to be moving as quick as they can to get to Port Moresby. <clears throat> pretty simple, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Okay, so what are the task forces we have out here? We got Task Force 1 and Task Force 2 that are out here right now. All right, now Task Force 1 uh, consists of the carrier uh, Shoho and a couple, three cruisers and some escort destroyers. Shoho was was a light carrier. Um, it had an aircraft complement of 12, I think. I mean, again, I think it was a, it was a converted heavy cruiser. And uh, had a crew complement or an air complement of twelve, and I think it was six fighters 
and I want to say six seaplanes for reconnaissance. It's not a strike carrier. I mean, it, it has 12 aircraft and only six of them are combat worthy. It's not like it was, you know, the other Japanese carriers here, the uh, Ju uh, Juikaku, Shokaku and Juikaku had, you know, air complements of 80 to 90 aircraft. It's 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 an escort. It, it, it has a specific job to just escort. It's not a frontline carrier. Its main job is going to be escorting the Tulagi invasion force. And that's and that <clears throat> kind of what historically was its plan as well. Now, what about the Tulagi task force? Where is the Tulagi task force? Well, that's these guys right here. Task force two. This is the Tulagi task force. That's got a couple destroyers, a converted mine layer that was carrying troops and some troop transports. Of course, obviously, their destination is going to be Tulagi. So basically, when Task Force 2 is directed to move, it's just going to be straight towards Tulagi. The Shoho and her task force are going to be escorting the Tulagi task force, the, uh, the Maru, the, the converted seaplane tender down here is going to be escorting. So two task forces, their target is going to be the Tulagi task force. Now, what's going to happen when the Tulagi task force, if they get to Tulagi and unload? Well, at that point, three and four will, well, I haven't really decided yet. Four would probably stay at Tulagi because they have the seaplanes and the seaplanes would then start operating out of Tulagi. Probably keep the two cruisers, the two light cruisers there with it as well. Maybe even attach all of them to the Soho uh, battle group. And then the Soho battle group's job, as soon as the Tulagi escort is done, the Tulagi, uh, then the Soho battle group will then focus on Task Force 3, which is the Port Moresby. So we're going to have these Three task force, ignore ignore task force three, converging onto Loggy, and then as soon as that's done, they're going to be spreading back out to go and link up with the Port Moresby invasion force, which again, remember, I'm not going to be moving them until turn four. Okay, great. So that's what the that's what the Japanese have got on the field right now. <clears throat> but oh gee, the Japanese had a couple carriers. That, yes, they did. They had the carriers uh, Shukaku, uh, Shokaku and Juikaku, which were two carriers that were at Midway. They were uh, the two two of Japan's six big carriers. Uh, Emperor Hirohito, I think it was, it was Hirohito was, uh, yeah, no, no, not Emperor. It was Emperor. <laughs> oh God, I'm getting my names mixed up. Uh, the two carriers, uh, Hirohito did not want to commit the two carriers to Coral Sea because he didn't think they would be back and be ready in time for his planned invasion of Midway. Originally, there were supposed to be six Japanese carriers at Midway. Kagi, Kaga, Shoryu, Shoryu, Hiryu, uh, Juikaku, and Shokaku. However, his naval high command talked him into dis, uh, dis detaching the Shokaku and Juikaku and sending them down here to Coral Sea to assist with Midway, and the plan was hopefully those two carriers would get back. This is why I say Coral Sea set the stage for our victory at Midway. Had the Japanese been able to succeed in driving off our carriers, sinking our carriers, whatever, and getting those two carriers back in time to participate at Midway, that would have been six carriers at Midway. We got lucky at Midway as it was facing only four carriers. Those two carriers could have really, 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 because that would have been another 180 aircraft that the Japanese could have thrown against us. I don't think our three carriers could have... It, it, World War II could have turned out much, much differently had the Shokaku and Juikaku been at Midway. But they weren't. Historically, Shokaku uh, took three or four thousand pounders on the flight deck and was out for several months, and the Juikaku's air crews were just devastated all to hell and back. And surprisingly enough... The Juikaku did get back in time and could have joined the attack on Midway, but they decided not to send her because she didn't have the air, the, a full air complement. They never crossed their minds. The Japanese set up their training regimes that their air squadrons were to be assigned, as they were training, were to be assigned to certain carriers. Unless that carrier got sunk and then they would, they, they would get, it would get transferred someplace else. The air crews that were training, that were to be assigned to the Shokaku and Juikaku, 
were never speeded up to fill out the Jokaku or the Juikaku's uh, a fighter compliment or air, <clears throat> airplane compliment. <clears throat> they could have taken. Now, granted, would they have been the elite, the cream of the crop, the carrier pilots that were, you know, had bombed Pearl Harbor and was the same quality of the Akaga Kagosori in here? No, they wouldn't have. But they could have been able to get enough air crews to put that fifth carrier. And again, I've already mentioned, we barely won it facing against four carriers. Even a fifth Japanese carrier at Midway could have turned the tide. Now, the U.S., the U.S., they said, screw it, just put the pilots on the ships and, and on the carriers and send them out. Japanese doctrine was totally different, and it never crossed their mind. Juikaku was not touched during the Battle of Coral Sea. It was perfectly operable. It just didn't have the air crews. The Japanese high command never even thought just to, to, to scrape air crews from their training programs and combine them into the Juikaku's air complement. How high command could miss something like that is just boggling. I'm grateful because, like I said, even if that fifth carrier had shown up at, at Midway, <coughs> the entire war would have gone completely, completely different. So, anyways, where are the carriers uh, Shokaku and Juikaku? Well, they don't show up. They're Task Force 5, and they don't show up until turn 10. Now, historically, and the Japanese plan, as most Japanese plans, needlessly and overtly difficult... Originally, the plan was for the Shoho, all three of the Japanese carrier, carriers and their two task groups to escort Tulagi, the Tulagi invasion force, to Tulagi, offload. Then the Shokaku Juikaku would go out hunting the American carriers because they knew America had at least one carrier in the area. They knew we had one. They had no idea we had a second one in the area. That was a bit of a surprise to them. And even if there was, they were confident they'd be able to sweep it, sweep it aside. And so the original plan was they were to come up here. They were coming from truck. They come into Rabul. Now, they had nine zeros that they were escorting or carrying, and they were supposed to deliver to Rabul. On the first day, they launched the aircraft, but the, the zeros couldn't land at Rabul because it was raining and the cloud cover and they couldn't get in. All right. So right there, their timetable is getting disrupted because the Shokaku and Juikaku's task force is having to stay behind while the Soho and the Tulagi task force is moving on towards Tulagi. So they wait for the second day. The second day happens. Again, it's rained in. They can't launch. The, so the Japanese carrier task force was delayed for two days. Just streaming right out here and up in this area while the task force, while they were being invaded or while they were invading Tulagi. Now, at the, at the time when the Japanese were up here waiting to transfer the, transfer, transfer the planes, American, the task force Halsey had gotten a report that the Japanese invasion force was on its way. So it taken the Yorktown, the Lexington was actually still back some and was in the middle of refueling. So <clears throat> the Yorktown went off by itself, and the day after the invasion launched three strikes on the fleet that was at Tulagi, and I think they sunk a destroyer and damaged a few other things. Really, the damages were actually very minor and very light, considering they threw three strikes at it, and I think they lost three aircraft. And then, of course, after that was over, the carrier came back down this way and eventually would link up with Lexington and form into uh, Task Force 17. Had the Japanese carriers not been delayed for two days, the Japanese carriers would have been steaming off the northern Solomon Islands, would have known the American strikes, and would have been able to strike two carriers to one. Because the U.S. at the time didn't know that the Japanese carriers were up there. They actually, Halsey actually had expected the Japanese carriers to be up here. The, the simple fact that the Japanese carriers, the Shoho and Juikaku, came this way, their plan was to come around the Solomon Islands, enter the Coral Sea from the east, was something that Halsey never even had contemplated. He had thought they were going to be up here by the Bismarck Sea, coming in through this strait right here. So, but on the first day, when Halsey was up here launching the strikes against the Tulagi, had the Japanese not been delayed for two days, we could have lost the carrier, and that could have lost us the battle. Again, you take a look at it, this battle set up the victory at Midway, which allowed us to win the war. It really is a really, really interesting. I mean, I, I really, if you're a student of military history whatsoever and you don't know about Coral Sea, really, I mean, I don't care what anybody says. Providence was looking out for our ass both at Coral Sea and Midway. Those two battles right there ensured us winning the war.
And like I said, the only way we won Midway is because we were able to win at Coral Sea. And there was so much providence that was protecting us at Coral Sea. It's, it's, it goes against all military logic and judgment. We should not have won it. Well, we didn't kind of win it. It was kind of a draw, but we were able to do enough to keep the Japanese from declaring it a victory and set it. And like I said, set it in the stage for Midway. Anyway, so that's that yada, yada, yada. So anyways, the Shokaku and Juikaku Task Force shows up on turn 10, and I think they enter anywhere right along up here. Their plan is, is they are going to kind of do the same thing historically. I'm going to direct them towards Tulagi until we have an identification on the American task forces, and then they're going to make whatever task force they find as their main target. So, Jesus, 20 minutes, and I'm just still describing how I'm setting up the AI to run this. Okay, so that's historically similarity to how the Japanese said everything else. Uh, also, the Japanese were notorious for never using their own aircraft carrier aircraft for spotting. The first four days, the Japanese never bothered to launch any scout planes from the Juikaku or Shokaku. They relied entirely on land-based. U.S. is like, nah, send the dive, send dive bombers up. Go out, scout, whatever, do, you know. If you can't find the enemy, you can't bomb the enemy. You can't bomb the enemy, you can't win the battle. So, to mimic that, I'm going to say that only on May 4th are the Japanese carriers going to be able to send out Reconnaissance aircraft. <clears throat> well, above and beyond the normal seaplane allotment, which I don't think any of those carriers, I don't think the carriers had any seaplanes. But the Americans, like I said, the Americans throw out <laughs> dive bombers all the time to do their reconnaissance. All right, so that's a look at the Japanese forces. Uh, let's take a look at the American forces. We've only got four task forces, and apologize for the glare. It's kind of, well, anyways, so we've got this task force. Let's start with task force three. You can't probably see it because of the glare, but task force three right there. Task force three uh, consists of a single ship, the USS Tangier. Tangier, again, another light aircraft carrier. It's, let's see, let's, what does the Tangier have on it? The Tangier has a grand total of a half step of PBYs. So it's got about six or eight PBYs on it. It's a reconnaissance. It's it's basically reconnaissance. It doesn't even have any fighters for defense. It has no escorts. I'm just going to keep them kind of in the back and send their, their plane out on recon, not getting them really far forward. All right, what else have we got? We got Task Force 1 at Esprit de Santu. Now, as, Task Force 1, that's the Yorktown. Did I get okay? Yeah. So Task Force One is the Yorktown and her so, uh, associated uh, ships. The Lexington uh, is Task Force Two. So she's right up here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to limit myself to only moving one space per turn until I identify and get reports of all right, there the ta there the enemy task groups are. I mean, I could sit here right now and say, all right, I'm going to come since I know the I know the Japanese main carriers are not going to be coming on until turn 10. I can com I can be going balls out speed wise, get both of these carrier groups combined and, you know, just come up here and just totally obliterate. Well, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> like I said, I'm not going to have them move more than speed one until we identify Japanese task force. All right. Task force four is the refueling task force. There's two refuelers in there and two destroyers. Um, again, I'm not going to get them into combat. They're just holding back. I am going to kind of keep an eye on the fuel. I've got, uh, at least from the U.S. side, I've got my sheet of paper here written down. So, you know, Task Force 1 has 168 units of fuel before the, the, the ship with the lowest amount, which is basically the destroyers, before they run out. So this is just kind of a good guideline is that I've got 168 units of fuel to play with. So, and Task Forces 1, 2, and uh, uh, Task Force 5 have already spent one day's worth of fuel, so 24 fuel units. Or one, not one day's worth of fuel, one box worth of fuel. So I'll just be keeping this as kind of an a kind of an idea to keep track. And Task Force Three and Four, I'm not really going to worry about. Task Force Four is the Euler. The Euler, they can't move more than speed one plus anyway, so they're not they're not going to run out of fuel in the scope of this game. And Task Force Three, again, the Tangiers is the speed movement one plus, and you know, so therefore, 
you really can't move faster than speed one anyways, and has got like enough fuel for 200 turns, well beyond the scope of the game. However, Task Force 1, 2, and 5, I do kind of have to keep an eye on. So I'm going to be keeping that, and if I need to refuel, that's that Task Force right there. Now, I also, so <laughs> you sharp-eyed viewers out there may be saying, but there's only four American Task Force out there. You're right. The 5th American Task Force is a combined task force of U.S. and Anzac ships that will be showing up, uh, I think it's turn 15 down here. Their job was to try to intercept any, uh, any Japanese ships, uh, that would get through towards Port Moresby. Uh, the problem is, the closer you get towards Port Moresby with ships, the closer you get to Rabul and uh, Kaving, Kaving, I can never remember how to pronounce that, but you get closer to the Japanese airfields and you start getting under their air attacks. Now, granted, they didn't have a lot of good naval strike craft, but they had bombers. <laughs> and, you know, the bombers, they can do something, but they're not really that good against ships, but it's enough that you got to be wary of it. So, I already described the overall flow of battle for the Japanese. Also described the overall flow of how I'm going to conduct the Americans. <sighs> Is there anything else I need to go over as kind of the preamble to this game? No, I don't think so. I think we're good. Oh, another thing I had to do. I had to write down all the Japanese. I know the American aircraft inside and out. SPDs, TBDs, F4Fs. I mean, it's easy. The Japanese on the counters are all identified by their their actual nomenclature, like the Betty Bomber, G4M. I don't know what the hell all the different Japanese now. Nobody's ever referred to them as the, even any documentaries. The documentaries will also say, instead of saying, you know, uh, you know, for the, instead of the Zero, uh, saying the Mitsubishi uh, A6M2, they just call it the Zero. So I don't know what the actual nomenclature, the actual number designations are. I know what they're called, what their nicknames are. So, I, and there are a lot of, there are like 12 different classes of Japanese aircraft in this game. There's like six different classes of American aircraft. So, a bunch of different Japanese aircraft for me to keep track of. All right. Um, we're getting towards 30 minutes, so I need to go ahead and download this computer. And when I get back, and when we get back, we'll go ahead and step into turn one and see how bad I can mess this up. <laughs> I'll be right back. All right, let's go ahead and get this started. Uh, it's going to be very interesting because I've got stuff spread out on my side table here and over here, and there's just so many bits and pieces that I'm going to be dealing with. I got the weather track there. and uh, Yeah, like I said, this game takes up a lot of space. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the turn order. Uh, let's see if we can zoom this in and clear it up a little bit. All right, campaign game turn sequence of play. Let's go ahead and go through this. Check weather. First thing you do is check weather. All right, now this is dependent on what each individual box set special rules are going to be. It's going to be different for each game set and each box set that you play. So let's take a look. So for the Coral Sea, there's the Coral Sea specific rules. And special rules right here. Where is it? Weather right here. In operational scenarios, the weather condition decreases one level towards clear on a dice roll of one or two and increases one level towards gale on a die roll of six. Weather conditions do not change in a battle scenario. All right, well, that's pretty easy. So the first thing we do every turn is check weather. Now, this, the operation scenario does say it automatically starts off at rain. So let's see if we can zoom in a little bit so you can see kind of what the weather track looks like. Clear, cloudy, rain, squall, storm, gale, typhoon. <laughs> and each one of those have different effects on everything in the game. Uh, so, let's take that back out to normal. So, let's go ahead. <clears throat> Get my buckets of dice, because this game requires buckets of dice. Uh, where do we want to put the uh, Right there. All right, so let's roll first initially to see if there's a change in weather. One or two, it goes towards clear. Six, it goes towards gale. Now, if you notice, it says it goes towards gale. There's another level up there, typhoon. We can't get typhoons. Biggest we can get in this is, is weather condition six. So, we've got a two, so it is going to shift towards cloudy. So, it is now cloudy and not rainy. 
Well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> that's the first step. Okay. <clears throat> Two, assign aircraft in ready boxes to cap, search, or ASW missions. All right. I... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to go ahead and do it first just because I don't want to know what the Japanese uh, are going to do. So before I roll randomly for the Japanese, I'm going to go ahead and decide what I'm going to do. Now, if you remember last video, I was saying I thought that there were some missions that were the entire turn. I was correct. Um, cap missions and ASW missions are, are all... are you put them up and the, the planes don't have to land until dark. Search mission, strike missions is on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. So what we're going to do first initially, and you know, I could probably save myself some time. Let's see, because here we have Task Force 3, and we know they've got the PBYs, and the PBYs have got a range of 16-2. So now normally, their, their movement value right there is the 16-2. You can only move half of your movement Oh, well, the 16 is the movement, the 2 is the endurance. So normally, you can only move half, or you can only extend your search range out to half, because you got to be able to fly out and fly back. Unless you've got endurance 2, then you can go out to your full movement. So the PBY has got a movement of 16. So um, is it even worth it to send out any 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 13, 14, 15? Yeah, I mean, even the closest Japanese... Task force is more than 16 away, so I don't need to put him up. Uh, let's see. The Yorktown, uh, which is... Which is Yorktown is Task Force 1. What has she got for aircraft? So she's got... Well, let's go ahead and see if I can lay these guys out so you can see what all we're working with here. So this is the the air complement on the Yorktown. F4Fs, uh, TBDs, SPDs, you know, your <laughs> standard, standard uh, uh, 1942 American carrier strike group. All right, so since none of these aircraft have a endurance of two, they're all 12-1, 17-1, 17-1. So that means they can, remember, you always got to round up. So I can go uh, nine nine spaces out for their reconnaissance. So the Yorktown doesn't have anybody that's within nine spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, there's there's no task forces anywhere close enough that the Yorktown can even try, so I'm not even gonna bother putting anything up. Now the Yorktown, or the Lexington, that's a little bit different. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But I'm also not going to put any of those aircraft up because the, the Americans had no idea. I mean, again, this is the begin, the first day of the fight. They all the all the Amer all their assumption is all the Japanese ships are up here. Like I said, I couldn't even find any information about this little task force on here. So I'm not going to send out the task for any any search planes from here either because the belief is there's no Japanese ships in the area. They're all up here. Or they're supposed to be all up there. All right, so now let's go to the land-based stuff. This is going to be a little bit different. Esprit de Santu. Esprit de Santu's got a bunch of stuff on the island. But, you know, they've got some bombers. They've got some B-17s, some B-24s, P-39s. But again, I could send the bombers on reconnaissance, but their movements are like 15-1, 18-1. The B-17s have got 16 too. Again, I could extend them out to 16 hexes from Esprit de Santu, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, I mean, they could, they could get just a little bit beyond Tulagi, and they might be able to, but again, I'm not going to send them out because there is no assumption that Japanese ships are in the area yet. All right, so what other land bases do we have? Townsville? Way down here, again, in Australia. Let's see, what if what is Townsville got? What can they throw out for reconnaissance? Uh, they've got some B-17s. Yeah, they've got two, two full squadrons of B-17s. So they could go out 16 hexes. But again, from Townsville, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Again, the, the assumption is Japanese ships aren't there yet. So I'm not even going to send them out. 
Uh, Cairns, what has Cairns got? I think Karen, Cairns has got some fighters. Uh, Port Moresby. Port Moresby is up. Now, Port Moresby I will probably send some scouts out from because <laughs> Port Moresby is relatively close to Rabul and where the Japanese escorts are coming, or the Japanese strikes are coming from. So what have we got? We've got... We've got A24s, which have got a range of 16, so they can go eight hexes out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's not really worth it. Hudson's, which have, which are eight threes, and that's a British bomber, I believe, Hudson. So it's got an eight three, but it can only go eight out. So that's not going to get very far. The P3090s. So, but we do have we do have some PBYs. We do have a half flight, half step of PBYs with a 16-2. So that means they can actually go 16 hexes up. I say hexes and these are squares. Consider the terms interchangeable. So I'm going to go ahead and instead of putting it on search on here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to place it on the board just so it's easy for me to see. All right. When I'm trying to identify task force, you take in all the different aircraft that are on search that are in range and apply that towards finding the task forces. So, Port Moresby, we're going to go ahead, since he's doing the search, we'll go ahead and put him up. And what else do we have? We also got Tulagi. Tulagi actually does still at this point have uh, some aircraft, some PBYs, and they also have a small contingent of uh, uh, British and, I believe, Canadian commandos? Or was it Canadian and Australian commandos? Well, regardless, there is a small troop complement there. So, Tulagi does have a half step of PBYs. So they know the Japanese are going to be coming from that way. So let's just go ahead and put that out there so, so we know that we're going to be trying to look for there. So I'm doing this explanation now. I'm not going to get too dip in depth to it in the future turns because, again, for several turns, these guys aren't going to be launching any, and these guys aren't going to be launching any any searches because it's just everything is just too far out of way and it's just not worth it yet. So really, we're looking at at two counters of PBYs that hopefully we'll be able to spot the Japanese as they're in as they're coming in. All right, so that's the U.S. So now let's go ahead and figure out what the Japanese are going to do. So for that, we have to go to the solitaire mission table. Yay! So, do I actually want to go through and roll for every, the, yeah, you know what, let's, 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 let's just do it. Let's shift the camera a little bit so we can get a look, hopefully a little bit clearer look at the Japanese cards. Okay. Let's see, let's put that right there, get a couple dice. All right, so what do we have at uh, Kavin? Okay, so they've got some bombers there and some fighters. So we got some bombers, level bombers. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Oh, shoot, I need a 20-sided dice for this. I didn't even realize that. It's not a problem. I have got a 20 sided dice. There we go. There's a good 20 sided dice. All right. So just basically roll for each one of the AIs. So 10. And since it's a level bomber, let's see what exactly is that. That is a G4M1. I'm looking at my sheet that I wrote up earlier. I think that's a Pete. G4M1. No, it's a Betty. All right. So it's a Betty bomber. It's a level bomber. We rolled a 10. So it's going to be going on a land strike. So we'll just go ahead and keep them in the ready box. And the fighters. What are the fighters going to do? Fighters, the 15 is going to do an escort. So they are going to escort... The Betty Bombers on a strike. Now, let's see. They got 24 2, so they got a. Okay, but the fighters have only got a range of 18. So the fighters can only go out 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, okay, so the fighters 
you see what I was counting out. They're coming from here. The fighters will escort the bombers as far as they can, but then go back. But the rest of the bombers will go to Port Moresby. And I'm an idiot because I didn't bother to put any of my fighters on cap in Port Moresby. So, that is what those guys are doing. And you know what? Let's just go ahead and take those bombers off and put them on Port Moresby itself so we know that they're striking Port Moresby. And I would bring the cap along, but they fall a couple, three spaces short. And it doesn't matter, or the escorts, but it doesn't matter because I don't have cap up anyways. All right, so that's what uh, uh, Kaving is doing. So what do we have next? Rabul? Take a look at what Rabul has. Rabul has got uh, some fighters, some seaplanes, and some level bombers. All right, so let's go with the fighters first. Fighters is 10. They're going to be going on escort. So the PBYs, let's see what the, these would be seaplanes. Uh, 16. Oh, they're going on ASW. All right. Well, that's kind of cool. So let's go ahead and take them. I'll put them in the ASW box. And the level bombers. We roll the 15 with the level bombers, and they're actually going on search. All right, so since these guys don't have anybody that they're escorting because there's no strikes that are going out, we're going to go ahead instead and stick, stick them on cap. So we've got some ASW, uh, some, yeah, some ASW searches going on, the fighters on cap, and since we are using these the level bombers as a search group, we're going to go ahead and put them on the map to remind us what their radius is. Okay, Gazmata. What do they get? Where's Gazmata? Okay, Gazmata is really, really close to Port Moresby. And what have they got? Let's see. They've got some fighters. They've got some level bombers. They've got two things of level bombers. All right, so let's go with the level bombers first. Let's see what the level bombers are going to do. 19 is ASW, and 5 is a naval strike. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and leave one of the bombers in the ready box, and we're going to take the other bomber, put it in the ASW box, like so. Now, what are the fighters going to do? The fighters are rolling a 4, so they're going to be on cap. So we're going to put them in the cap box, like so. All right, so, and then next, Lao, whoops off my aircraft on my U.S. carriers. I should have put fighters up on cap over Port Moore. Thinking to myself earlier, it's like, yeah, I got to remember to do it. Yeah, I'm an idiot. I forgot to do that. Oh, well. All right. So, Leao, we have uh, fighters and level bombers. I think that's a level bomber. And one of the other things is that these are not cut the greatest. So, yeah, G4M1. And again, because I can't remember the Japanese nomenclature. G4M, that's a Betty Bomber, so that's a level bomber. All right, so let's go with the, the bomber first. Level bomber, they're doing a six. That's going to be a land strike. Uh, so really the only land strike that they have in, in distance is, of course, going to... Well, no, they could hit Tulagi. I think they can hit Tulagi. They've got a range of 24. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, they could hit Tulagi. So we'll just go ahead. Well, let's see what the fighters are doing. The fighters are on cap. They're really worried about <laughs> U.S. fighters. All right, so we got this bomber. I probably could have done the same thing with the, with the group from the bombers from Rabul. So we actually have the choice. And I'm, well, you know what? No. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's send these guys on a strike to Tulagi. Just so just so we can see how land strikes work. We're going to be hitting Tulagi. We're going to be hitting Port Moresby. Tulagi has no fighters that they could have put up. Port Moresby has, but I'm an idiot and didn't put any up. All right. Um, all right. Shokaku, Juikaku are not on board yet. Uh, the Shoho is. They're way up here still. And let's see what the Shoho has. Show's got some fighters, some fighters, and some fighters. Wow, she doesn't have any reconnaissance whatsoever. All right, so the Shoho basically has got nothing but fighters. So let's roll 
First one is going to be escort. There's nothing to escort. Six is cap, and one is cap. So, yeah, they're just going to all go on cap. Why? Don't know, but they're doing it anyways. All right, and then the uh, Kamakaru Maru, which is this task force is way out here, and I know she's got two seaplanes because I looked at it earlier. And she actually has two different types of seaplanes. F1M, which I believe was based on the Zero design, and the E13A. So, and again, you can tell ranges are not that great. But these are seaplanes, and they are kind of kind of doing anti-submarine warfare. But let's take a look at what the seaplanes are going to do. Zoom in. There we go. Uh, eight is going to be a search for the F1M, and. Seven, which is also going to be a search with the F1M. So we're just going to go ahead and take these two guys and stick them on the carrier. Now, let's see. The range is going to be four for the F1M because it doesn't have the endurance. However, the ET3A has an 8-2, so it can go out eight hexes. One, two, three, four, five, six. It could possibly... They could possibly spot this task force. All right. So that is the aircraft being assigned. If you're playing this head-to-head, -head, you have these off. You, these are kept as sideboards. Your opponent doesn't know what you're doing. You, you simultaneously set your air missions and then reveal them all. Uh, but as we're playing solitaire, is it the most logical way of doing it? No, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure there will come a point when the carriers are close to each other, and instead of rolling, it's like, nah, the carriers are just going to launch everything as strikes, and I'm not even going to roll to see what they're doing. Just just go do a strike. All right, now the problem is, once you launch a plane, you have to see if there are any casualties. Yes, launching planes cause casualties. Oh, let's see if I can find it. If it's, uh, where is it? Let's move my camera back. Again, like I said, we're going slow because we're taking this step by step and I'm going through and explaining everything. But when you launch aircraft, where is it? Where is it? Aircraft takeoff and landing right here. So basically, if it's an aircraft counter, if you roll two or less, negative two or less, you lose a step. Negative one or less, a seaplane, car a seaplane loses one step. Zero to six, say, take off or landing successful. All right, so honestly, most of the times you're not going to be worried about rolling it. However, again, because procedurally, let's take a look at the dice rolls. Landing on a carrier with a half deck destroyed. Well, we're not landing anything, so you don't have to worry about that. Landing on carrier with deck hits this turn. Again, not that, not a situation. Every two hits on minor airfield or three hits on a major. Again, all the airfields are all nice and nice and fancy. Night takeoff, eh, night landing. Eh, again, none of these are these are taking place. Now, if you remember what I said, I love these charts. However, they're not as complete as they could be. The chart that actually comes in the game is a little bit more. I don't want to say robust, but more complete when it comes to takeoff and landing modifiers. So. This is what we have to look at. Clear, cloudy, rain, squall, storm, gale, night takeoff, night landing, yada, yada, yada. It's got those fours, but for some reason, the master one that I got from BGG doesn't have weather conditions. All right, so the weather is cloudy because we rolled the weather and it went from rain to cloudy. So it's a minus one on the dice roll. Really, the only, there, there's, there's nothing that's going to affect any of it because... The only thing that could be effect, that we could be looking at to be affected are seaplanes, and they take a step loss on a minus one. What's the lowest you can roll on a one-sided dice? A one. You subtract one from that, it's zero. So for a seaplane to have any effect, you have to have at least minus two modifiers and any other planes to be affected uh, or any other flights, it's a minus three. And really, if you take a look at it, only when you're landing or taking, landing on carriers that have been damaged, night takeoffs, night landings, or you start getting into rain, squall, storms, then you kind of have to worry about it. We don't have that condition right now. So since there are no damaged carriers that we're going to be landing on and the weather isn't inclement enough to affect it, 
that's something that I can remember. All right, now that I know this, in future turns, if it's not at least rain weather or I'm landing on a carrier, I don't have to worry about takeoff and landing rolls. However, because we're doing this procedurally, we had to go over it. Okay, what do we got next? Write orders for fleets as required, number of turns ahead. All right, since I'm doing this solitaire, I'm throwing that right out the window. There was part of me that was kind of thinking of writing out my orders beforehand for my groups like I'm supposed to. However, we already know, I've already put down what the AI's plans are going to be. Since, since I'm going up against an AI, it really doesn't matter if I write my turns. Okay, it does a little bit. But since all of my task force are intercept task forces, I write one turn ahead anyways. Procedurally, yes, I should be writing them down. I'm not going to just because it's going to save me time. You don't want to see me writing out orders uh, for five, four different task forces when I'm just playing against an AI. So we're not going to do that. Does that give me a little bit of an advantage because I can react a little bit better? Yeah, sure, it does. But again, I'm doing it as a time-saving procedure. So, but again, procedurally, if we were playing this correctly. Okay, air search. Okay, so that's right orders. Fourth step, air search and ASW patrols executed. All right, now this is where we go looking for stuff. Who do we have? Let's start off with ASW. Do we have anybody on ASW? Yes, we do. We've got a couple on ASW from Rabul and Gasmata. I know I'm butchering that name. Uh, so Rabul has got... Let's take a look. Okay, she's got a 17-4. So she, that's actually a pretty damn impressive... Uh, uh, endurance but so it since since we're only looking at the first number and it has at least an endurance of two we can look out 17 hexes from rabul and the other one is a 19 two so she can look up to 19 hexes away so what does that mean well so gasmata is here rabul is here let's see we do have focus we do have a couple american uh submarine groups in range that they could potentially spot. Uh, as we said from Gasmata, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That one's definitely in range. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Definitely in range. So both of them are in range. Let's see, I think Gasmata is actually in range. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. One. Yeah, okay. So both task forces, both American subgroups are within range of both the ASW strikes, or not ASW strikes, the ASW searches. This is important. Now, normally, if I'm playing it, the opponent would send, say he's doing it. We would figure out the radius. I'd look down at where my things are jotted, say, all right, yeah, there's something there that you can roll for. Actually, I don't even think I say that. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the rules specifically for ASW. Now, you've got to remember... Since these guys are on, ASW can be committed for the entire turn. Those guys that are assigned to ASW every turn during the daylight can continue to search and try to do anti-submarine searches. Let's go ahead and find... Da, 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 da. I have found that showing the rules as I read through it kind of helps both you and me. Let's see, Combat Air Patrol... Uh, ASW patrols, right here. Uh, during the air patrol phase, players may place aircraft on ASW patrol. These air units may not undertake any other missions during the turn. ASW aircraft may remain in the ASW box for all remaining daylight turns of the day on which they were assigned ASW. The only player may land them on any turn, but is not required to land them until the air return phase of the day's last daylight turn. Hunter Killer. Uh, during the air search phase, aircraft on ASW patrol may search for enemy submarines. ASW player declares an ASW search, indicates the base from which the search will be conducted, and the shortest range of the aircraft making the search, rolling one dice and adding any modifiers from the air search table. Seaplane steps count as double. That's something we need to remember because uh, these, these are not seaplanes that are doing it, but seaplanes do get bonuses for ASW. On a result of six or more, the search finds a submarine. 
If an enemy submarine flotilla is within range of the ASW search, the owning player must indicate the zone occupied by or one adjacent to. So, yeah, if you're playing against another person, you don't have to tell them the exact location. You can be up to one space away, but yeah. It, uh, if the submarine flotilla is located, the ASW player rolls a die a second time on a roll of a six once submarine from the flotilla is destroyed. All right, so that seems pretty easy. Let's go ahead and take a look at what modifiers we have for ASW searches. Uh, CV mines, where is it, where is it, where is it? Submarine strike, submarine MTB, sweep, cap, air search, air strike, air search results, airfield, come on, where is it? Airfield, is it not on here? It may not be on here. Let's go take a look at the master chart. I haven't coalesced both the master chart or not. Uh, okay. Contact, modifiers, modifiers, initiatives, sight range, air search modifiers, cap, cap, air, target location, A mods, bombing, ASW modifiers, submarine, okay, we're okay. Would it be, I guess it would just be air search modifiers then. I think it would have to be air search modifiers. Let's take a look at the rules again. Again, they don't have the charts labeled. It doesn't say go to chart x for whatever it just says and add any modifiers on the air search table all right so let's see what's light identified as the air search table air search mod well that's air search modifier is there something actually labeled air search table no there isn't there's air search result let's take a look see again it's a good system but they could really use a tightening up on the verbiage on a lot of stuff. I think it's probably the air modifier chart, but it doesn't say that. Surface search, pursuit, submarine procedure, MB, MTB, aircraft, air repair. Okay, so it's got to be. It's got to be the air search modifiers. All right, so. Uh, three to four steps to search aircraft. Nope. Target sighted last turn. No one. Task force unloading in coastal zone. Nope. Search aircraft including fighters. Nope. Task force is three to four zones from search base. Now, does is the flotilla identified as a task force? Let's say yes, just for now. Okay, so let's see. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces away for this task force. Um, and you, from what I it, from what I understand, air searches work a little bit different than ASWs. I can't combine ASWs together. Each ASW tries to search independently. <laughs> I could be messing that up. So. All these steps, uh, uh, the, the the step searching for aircraft, not going to work in this situation. So task force, seven to eight zones from search base, minus three. And then weather is cloudy, it's, so it's another minus one. Yeah, see, that seems like an awful lot. So it's a minus four to the dice roll. And I have to have a six? I am definitely going to have to look into that because I think... I think I may be doing that wrong, but we're going to go for that now. So since basically it's impossible for me to, to, to spot the, the American submarines, their flotillas, because I'm not close enough. Uh, okay, so they went up there. They were looking around, eh, flying around trying to spot them. Okay, didn't find them. I don't have anything on ASW. So I don't have to, the Americans don't have any ASW flights up, so they don't have to worry about it. Um, so air searches now. All right. Now, this is why we have so many of the air search markers out there. Okay. So for the U.S., we've got, uh, only one air search out there. These PBYs here and they've got a rank. Come on, focus. They've got a 16 too, so they can search out 16 spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
Let's try that again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Yeah, okay, so they, they are going to be in range. Uh, the PBYs, uh, do I have PBYs? Yeah, I have PBYs there. They've got range 16, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so they could spot at Rabul. So this, whoops, <laughs> big count it down, and you can't see clearly because my camera doesn't auto zoom. Uh, wow, 32 minutes already in this recording. All right, so this flight has a po possibility. And you got to remember, this, this is not one aircraft. It's multiple aircraft. They're going out, so they can possibly spot multiple different task forces. Let's go ahead and take a look at the search rules. just to make sure we're doing that right. Air search. All right, during the air search phase, aircraft in a base's search box may attempt to cite enemy task forces. Search aircraft may search for every task force within half the range aircraft, half of the aircraft's range from its base. Uh, for example, an aircraft with a range of 17-1 may search for an Range of 16-2 may search for any enemy task force within 16 zones. Oh, yeah, we've already gone over that. Procedure. Each player adds up the number of steps of all search aircraft within range to search for enemy target. Search player indicates the task force he or she wishes to cite, roll a dice, and apply the applicable modifiers on a result of three or more the target is cited. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at our air search chart. Uh, where is it? Sweep, cap, air search, right. Okay, so air search. The most we're going to have, we're going to have one step. Or actually, we're not even at one step because those are half steps. So, yeah, we don't even have to worry about this number of steps because that's not going to give us a positive modifier because I don't have that many steps within range. Okay, so target sighted the last turn. Nope. Target unloading a coastal zone. Nope. Search aircraft includes fighters. Nope. Target task force is X amount of zones away. Okay, so let's go ahead and pause this real quick so I can download it. We'll come back and continue with the search. Okay, so we cannot have, since we need a, let's see if we can find it, a three or less, or is it three or more? Three or greater. On a single six-sided dice to be able to spot uh, an enemy task force. You can't. We can't have any more than minus four modifiers. Um, and we're in a squall. Is that what it is? Overcast? No, cloudy. Cloudy, not a squall. So a cloudy right off the bat. Let's take a look at that one. Let's take a look at this one. Um, cloudy is a minus one. So at best, if we get a minus three more modifier, there's just no way we're going to be able to spot it. However, <laughs> task forces, nine zones from search base and all our search aircraft, and we don't have enough steps of search aircraft to give us any positive modifiers. Uh, yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> just can't spot them at all. Now, had I known that beforehand, I wouldn't have bothered putting them guys up on, on, on search because they were just too far away with the weather conditions. Wouldn't have been able to spot them. So, you know, my search aircraft here and here, they just can't spot any of the task force. Now, and conversely, the search aircraft that the Japanese have out can't spot anything either, except for one of the aircraft from here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that aircraft right there that's got the range of the eight slash two is within eight hexes of Task Force Two. So, and within eight, it's a minus three. So right there, we're looking at a six. However, it is cloudy. So <laughs> that does kind of shoot it out of the sky. So regardless of all the air searches we put up, we weren't close enough, nor did we have enough air steps in a particular area or against this particular task force to be able to spot anybody. So let's go ahead and take these. And since we're done with them, uh, they go into the hangar from where they came from. And I just realized this is probably going to be a 
stupid thing for me to have done because it might be a little bit hard for me to... Well, the, these search aircraft that are on the... Oh, no, no, I should be able to do it. Oh, it's the search aircraft. Yeah, Task Force 4 goes back to the uh, Kamakawu Maru. Uh, the search aircraft that was up here at Rabal. We're going to go ahead and put them into the hangar at Rabal. And that's all the search aircraft I believe we had out there. Everything else was strike. Oh, yeah, the <laughs> allied stuff. PBYs from Tulagi. Put them into the hangar. Don't put them into the ready box. You put them into the hangar box. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit on that to see. See, we have hangar, ready, cap, search, and ASW. So since they just came back from a mission, you put them into the hangar box. Uh, actually, yeah, and Port Moresby. Put him in the Port Moresby hangar box, even though they didn't find Jack. Now, normally, you also roll to see... Well, actually, we don't do that yet. Well, there's not going to be any aircraft landing on carriers. Uh, I don't think airfields getting hit have any modifiers for landing. ASW... Takeoff and landing modifiers. Yeah, it's just airfields aren't affected by being damaged. It's just landing on a carrier with more than half its deck boxes destroyed or landing on a carrier that received deck damage this turn as modifiers. So uh, the planes would be rolling to land. However, normal planes, I need a negative, or seaplanes, I need a negative one. Normal planes, I need a negative two. Uh, and with all the conditions, cloudy is only a minus one, so it's not even worth rolling to see if I have any casualties on landing because it's beyond the realm of possibility. So, all right, so that's the search and... Uh, okay. Air search and ASW. Assign aircraft in ready boxes to airstrikes. All right, so we've already... Actually, we kind of already did that when we were rolling earlier. Uh, this would be my time that I guess I would do it because, uh, as we've seen, the AI does that earlier. Uh, so... Uh, after assign aircraft and ready boxes is move fleets. Check for fuel and check for foundering. All right, so since I'm going first, I'll go ahead and move my stuff first. And like I said, I'm not going to move any of my fleets or anything more than one hex. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave the, uh, the, who is that, PF1? Uh, we'll leave the Yorktown at Esprit de Santo until we get a, get a good solid contact. Uh, Task Force 2, eh, they're just going to stay where they are. Task Force 4 is going to Task Force 3 is going to go ahead and move. They're going to get a little bit closer. That's the uh, Tangiers. That's the uh, seaplane tender. So we want to get them a little bit closer out there so they can uh, commit their airplanes to searches. So that's basically all my... And then, like I said, normally if I was playing this against someone else, I'd be committing the orders that I wrote out the turn previous, but since I'm doing the solitaire and I don't feel like writing out the orders, um, uh, yes, I'm, I know, I'm fully aware I am not playing this by the rules, but for ease, for my own ease of gameplay and to speed up the gameplay, we're not going to be doing that. I already explained that. So, All right, so now we have, oh, that was my, ta my fleet movements. Now it's the Japanese fleet movements. Now, again, we're going with the AI system which is this table right here. So we have to know what the fleets are, and, well, what their destinations are. So let's go ahead and let's start with uh, TF4. And we said that their objective is going to be the uh, Tulagi Task Force. They're going to try to hook up with the Tulagi Task Force. So let's take on, where should I put this? Yeah, we'll go ahead right here. That's good. All right, so... Uh, first of all, go ahead and determine fleet speed. So 17 is going to be one zone, so the, they're only going to move one zone. Uh, submarine speed, we don't... Oh, we don't... Well, the submarines we aren't worried about. Um, and then the direction, 19, right and away from desired direction. All right, so their di desired direction is up here. So they're going to move right and one away. So that is right and one away. Not something I'd expect the Japanese player to do, but hey, you know, whatever. That's what the AI is. All right, so let's go ahead and do for this uh, submarine. And 
So submarine task force is right here. Let's see, 14 is gonna be one zone. What are their what are their what are their ah, so that's the thing. I need to decide what their objectives are. They don't really have objectives. So I guess they're just gonna remain in the remain on station until we have a, a good 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 tar, a good uh, lock on something. I think that's uh, till we get a task force spotted. I think the submarines are just not gonna move. I could have moved my submarines, but again, I'll just keep them on station where they're at. Uh, so all right, so here's the uh, Port Moresby invasion force, and we're gonna say they're not gonna move until turn four. Uh, or day, yeah, no, no, day four, which would be turn 24 or something like 25, 26. All right, so uh, this is the Tulagi invasion force. And let's see, there are 18, so they're going to move one zone. And directly away from, well, okay, I'm going to override that. I'm going to think, no, you know what? Actually, I'm not even going to roll for it because they should just be moving full on. To try to reach Tulagi. Historically, the invasion of Tulagi happened on May 3rd. However, according to this, the earliest they could get there by counting out with their maximum movement speed and everything is like the 4th. So even knowing what the historical setup is, uh, yeah, the game system just doesn't exactly <laughs> reflect it. So, but we're going to say that, yeah, they're just going to move at all maximum possible speed to Tulagi. I'm not even going to roll for going variation or deviation or anything like that. Just because I believe that a human player would probably do that. All right, so I'm in Task Force 1, which is the Soho Task Force. Their objective is support and escort uh, the Tulagi Task Force. So, let's see, 1, so they're going to move at full speed. And now I have to look actually look at that Task Force to see what their full speed is. Oh, well, the Soho's can only, you can only move as fast as your slower ship. And the slower ship in the Task Force is a 2+. plus which is the Shoho, so they can move two normally. They'll be able to move three on an even number turn because of the two plus, but it's not an even number turn, so they're going to move two spaces. And 11, uh, left of desired direction. So left of desired direction, let's see, we'll go ahead and put them right there. And two movement points for right there. It's the best of des left of desired direction that I can get. Again, a human opponent would have probably something completely different written out. We're just using the solitaire tables. <laughs> That's what we're going with. All right. So that, I believe, is all for movement. Uh, uh, check for contact between surface fleets and resolve tactical combat. Nope. Check for contact by submarines and resolve submarine attacks. Nope. Airstrike missions planned in step five are executed. So all those airstrikes and naval strikes that we set up, now's the time they'd be resolved. However, we don't have any naval strikes. We do, however, have two land strikes. So let's see about what happens with a quick land strike. We've got no cap, so we don't have to worry about intercepting them. Let's see, multiple cap groups, sweep missions, fighter escort, air to aircraft, airstrikes. Okay. Uh, to attack a task force that is not in a port, well, we're, we're attacking a port, so let's see, land strikes. Port strikes, land strikes. Flights may attack airfields and seaplane bases. Airfields have an anti-aircraft value of 12, seaplane bases have an anti-aircraft value of 8. Once anti-aircraft fire has been resolved, the strike player may attack the airbase. The strike player rolls a number dice equal to the total land attack factors of his or her strike aircraft and apply any modifiers from the land bombing table. All right, so anti-aircraft. Uh, task Force now resolves anti-aircraft. That's because we don't have any caps, so we got to resolve the anti-aircraft. Uh, total such values firing on aircraft into a single hex and half the result. Ship strike may not fire more than one airstrike or split its AA value. So, okay. A ship may fire its AA value at aircraft in its hex. Every other ship may fire its AA value at aircraft Oh, but that strength is half. So okay, so okay, so we're not having any of the the airstrikes or any of the anti-aircraft on the base. Roll a number of dice equal to the ship's modified anti-aircraft value and add any applicable modifiers. See the anti-aircraft modifiers table. On a result, the six-one step of attacking aircraft may not attack. 
Half of those steps not allowed to attack are destroyed. Players alternate choice with only player goes first. Anti-aircraft fire may not be conducted against high-altitude aircraft. Ooh. Ooh. Are these high-altitude aircraft? These might be high-altitude aircraft. Nope. It's, me it's medium. So you can see right here. M for medium. So can't fire at high range, high alt, base anti-aircraft fire cannot fire at high altitude or alt anti-aircraft in general. However, we can fire at them because it is medium fire. So we've got 12 dice of anti-aircraft fire. Actually, our anti-aircraft is actually listed on our airfield. So let's see, we're attacking Port Moresby. Uh, Port Moresby. Damn it, I knew I was going to freaking end up doing that. Damn it. Just too much stuff packed in here. <laughs> oh, God. All right, fix those later. All right, so we're taking a look. Port Moresby, its anti-aircraft value is five. So, five. Let's take a look at the anti-aircraft chart. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Air search, airfield bombardment, operational, foundry, and typhoon fuel mileage, minefield damage, minefield damage, submarine, MTB strike, aircraft takeoff and landing, all right, nothing on that sheet about any aircraft. We'll take a look at this one. Initiative, modifier, sighting ranges. Uh, that's tactical. That's all tactical. Takeoff landing modifier. ASW, air to air, target location. Oh, yeah, the only air. <laughs> all right, fine. The only A modifier is America after November 1944 plus one. Well, we're not in 1944, so that's the only modifier we have for anti-aircraft. All right, so go ahead, take our five dice for the field's anti-aircraft fire. Roll it. Every six is a hit. Boom, 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 boom. Nothing. No hits. All right, so the aircraft fire was, or the anti-aircraft fire was ineffectual. Now we have to bomb the enemy base. Okay, it was right there. Airstrikes. Strike player may attack the airbase. Strike player rolls a number of dice equal to his total land attack factors of his or his or her strike aircraft. Really? You had to put that in? Just use his as the general human being. Uh, strike aircraft and apply any modifiers from the land bombing table. Uh, da, 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 da. In addition to damage to air, okay, aircraft. Every three hits to an air base destroys one step of aircraft in the base's hangar or ready box. Players alternate choosing which steps are destroyed with the only player going first. In addition to damage to aircraft, every four hits to an air base during the same strike reduces the air base capacity by one, and then there is repairs. So let's take a look at what is the bomber's land value attack. Is land value attack, come on, is a two. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> well, if it, takes a, if it takes three hits to damage an aircraft and four hits to damage the airfield with two aircraft or with one step aircraft, not going to be able to do any damage to the airfield or the aircraft there. However, just because, let's go ahead and roll it. Five and two, oh, let's see what modifiers there are. Air search, pursuit, submarine, aircraft bombardment. No, that's airfield bombardment, foundry, typhoon, mileage, sweep, minefield, submarine, submarine. Really? Nothing on that sheet. Bless it. All right, air search, land bombing. Okay, there we go. Land bombing modifiers. Circled factor plus, oops, 
Circle factor plus one, dive bomber plus one, high altitude minus one, weather is rain minus one, squall minus two, storm a gale. Okay, so no modifiers, because we don't have circle factor or dive bombers. These are just level bombers. So no modifiers to the five and the three, five and the two I rolled, so no damage. That aircraft is going to return, and that came from Guess Manta. So let's go ahead and put that there into the hangar box. Or not the hangar box, the ready box. And then the same thing is going to happen over here at Tulagi with, again, strike value is only two. Not going to have any effect. Let's roll for anti-aircraft. Tulagi has anti-aircraft of one. That could happen. Two. No, doesn't hit. And the bombing. Ooh, wow. That actually... <laughs> okay, so, yeah, those guys would have done some damage. We'll say that they, they knocked out a couple things, but game-wise, just <laughs> doesn't do any, just doesn't do anything to it. So you need at least four dice worth of land strike, or at least three dice against a, against a uh, port or field, airfield, to do some kind of damage. Make these guys all nice and stacked up pretty. Okie dokie. All right, well, that's all for strikes. That was all the land strikes. There was no naval strikes. So let us go into... Dun, dun, dun. Uh, air, okay. Uh, aircraft in hangar boxes boxed move to ready boxes on bases and carriers. Okay, so this one I am going to have to read a little bit because just to make sure I'm getting this right because it gets a little funky with aircraft returning to the hangar and and uh from the from the from the uh from the hangar to the ready so let's go aircraft basing uh sweeps airstrikes if I can find it again air operations aircraft basing capacity Airbase card, limitations, readiness. Uh, air missions, flights, organizations, mission, movement, returning. During the air return phase, aircraft counters that land at an airfield are placed in the base's hangar box. At each airfield, players may place two aircraft counters, which just landed into the ready box, skipping the hangar box so they may fly a mission again next turn. On each CV, which has not suffered any hull damage, not CVE, CV. L or CVS, players may move one aircraft counter to the ready box. So, all the aircraft that land this turn, or all the aircraft that did something, return and go into the hangar. For airfields, you can have two of those immediately shift into the hang into the ready box. Carriers can have one. So, we didn't have more than two aircraft return. So, the Rabool... Both the aircraft that landed in the hangar goes into the ready box. These get moved into the ready box. The seaplane tender has one aircraft that it can move into the ready box. And I think what we're going to do is probably the one that's got the further range. So that'll go into the ready box. And the other seaplane will not. Up at Port Moresby, we only had one aircraft, so it'll go back into the ready box. And Tulagi has one aircraft, and it'll go back into the ready box. Now, is it one aircraft or one step? That's a very good question, because a lot of times it, everything is broken down by steps when they're talking about aircraft. Let's see that again. Air, air search. Flights, mission assignments. Okay, it just says, okay, returning, Let's focus, during the air return fares, aircraft counters that landed at an airfield are placed in the base's hangar box. At each airfield, players may place two aircraft counters, which just landed in the ready box. On each CV, which is not suffered, each, each players may place one aircraft counter. Now, again, you got to kind of be, be, 
kind of aware of things because they do say steps rather than counter a lot of times. So it is two aircraft counters for normal and one aircraft counter for carriers. Okay, so we did all that right. That's all good. Uh, let's see what next. Uh, special missions executed by ships that have done nothing else. Bombardment, loading, unloading, refuel, reinforcements, rearm, yada, yada, yada. If no combat occurs, ships can attempt emergency and flight deck repairs. Return one of every two lost steps of aircraft is salvaged. And aircraft that cannot stay aloft for another turn must return to base or be lost. Well, do we have any aircraft that are still up that can't remain? Cap? And ASW can remain throughout the all through daylight turns, so they don't have to return. So there we go, boys and girls. That's it. That is one operational turn of Second World War at sea. Took us a long time to get here, mostly because I was unfamiliar with things and I was going through and explaining things step by step. Now, now that I know things a little bit more that really you're not going to, you really shouldn't put out any aircraft for search unless they're at least it, it, as long, it, if they're more than eight hex, more than nine, nine or more hexes away, you're probably not going to spot them unless you've got a lot of steps on the search to give you the positive bonuses. So that will probably speed up my turn next turn. Also, we know now that it takes at least three hits. And the only way on, a, on, a, on an airport airfield to do damage, the only way to get that is by having at least three land factor strikes. So I think we may modify... Um, the rules if we have at least one bomber that from a japanese airfield that's going to strike we should probably send all the bombers along just so we can get maximum potential um so again that's something we you know we didn't know beforehand and that'll speed up gameplay a little bit uh yeah so i i think i think overall this turn went well i hope I didn't confuse too many people with it. Again, we're going to continue playing this. We're going to keep going through. Oh, what I do need to do is mark off fuel for the American fleets. And if you move zero or one, it's one fuel unit. And since all my task force were at one, so we've already, already used 24 fuel units in those task forces. So just one more point, fuel point, one more fuel point. Task force five hasn't shown up yet, so I don't have to worry about marking fuel off that. But uh, Task Force 1, even though it was in port, well, actually, in probably in port, it wouldn't need to. Eh, I may look at refueling that in port. I think it takes three turns to refuel everything. Ah, we'll take a look at the rules. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and mark it as one fuel point spend anyways, because unless you're tied up next to the pier, your engines are going to be running to give electricity to the ship anyways. I don't care if you don't move a foot. Even when we were anchored, our ships were always, the engines were always running just because that's how our electricity is generated. Now, when you're pier side, yeah, you just, you, 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 you take power from the, uh, from whatever port you're at. God, sea and anchor details were a pain in the ass. Fortunately, I wasn't an electrician or I was, and I wasn't, well, I wasn't an engineer, so I never had to worry about hooking up any of that stuff. Um, so yeah, okay, I'm kind of enjoying this. I can really dig how it'd be a lot funner with uh, with face to face, but yeah, we're definitely going to keep going through this. We're, I don't know if we're going to do the entire campaign, but we definitely are going to continue this, and I think I'm I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. Uh, so yeah, that's all I got. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section. I'll see you in the next time. See ya!